Hello everyone, CJ here, bringing you the second half of the How to Dungeon Master series. After going through the technical stuff, we are now going to talk about the philosophical aspect of dungeon mastering. So, you want to challenge your players and provide fun for everyone, yeah? Yeah, that's great, because that's what this video is all about. I will be talking about all the important stuff I've learned from my experience dungeon mastering. I will also discuss what other people who are much smarter than me have said and written about creating fun. Don't go away, or you will miss the story about the bard who dropped his pants. The perfect dungeon master is multi-talented. He or she is a great writer, game designer, storyteller, performer, mathematician, and even a counselor. Then again, nobody is perfect. So don't sweat about not being great at everything. Because in the end, the most important thing is, I think we can all agree on this, is that everybody has fun. Now, we are getting into the meat of the discussion. Let's look at what people consider to be fun. Some of you may say, Hey CJ, do you think we are stupid? Of course we know what is fun. Fun is squatting by the curb with your crew. I would say, hold on Boris, I know that you feel very strongly about your preferred activity, but let's listen to what Michael Shore has to say. He is a PhD and the Vice President of the Worldwide Consumer Insight at Mattel. He has also done a large study into behaviors considered to be fun. The subjects of the study are children, but I think the result is still very relevant to players of all ages because I would argue that their sense of fun more accurately reflects the impulses of our inner child. After combing through the data, he discovered 10 common themes that he interpreted as expressions of fun. It is what he imagined people might say when they experience something fun. Number 1. I am free By its very nature, Dungeons & Dragons is a game that allows for great amount of freedom, so don't forget about its inherent strength. Let your players create their own goals and solutions. Help them make their plans work. Do not put NPCs and environment before your players if you are not going to allow your players to break them. Number 2. I dream. Invite them to contribute to the world you have built. Let them create lasting repercussion through their character's action or even directly in the world building process during session zero. Three, I am special. Let them be lucky. There is a reason why the success at Natural 20 homebrew rule is so popular. Occasionally grant them special privileges if the situation suits their character's backstory. Four, I belong. Cooperative play is fun, but so can sabotages if that's what everybody is doing. Five, I am wacky. Allow their characters to be weird. Allow them to be three halflings in a trench coat as a character. Six, I know. Let them explore and gain mastery of the game. Teach them to be better at the game if you have to. Seven, I am cozy. Provide a safe, non-judgmental environment. Don't laugh at failed roleplay attempts. Laugh with them. Eight, I am proud. Praise their heroic deeds and accomplishments. Give them positive feedback. 9. I stand out. Spotlight characters and give them time to shine. 10. I dare. Give them confidence. Let their character be an expert at something. And that's your 10 expressions of fun. I know that it's going to be really tough trying to fit all these into your game. Well, a dungeon master's job is never easy, but you may not have to do all those because your players may prefer a certain type of fun over others. Boisterous groups may enjoy open competition between players. Others may prefer a comfy, friendship-soaked adventure in Equisteria. You know, I could go into the different D&D player types as described in the Dungeon Master's Guide, or discuss the Bartle's taxonomy of player types. But there are already many great resources about these different classification of players out there. It is a good starting point, but let's put things into perspective. These classifications are derived from thousands and perhaps even millions of different players. Let's face it, you are not going to run games for that many players at a time. All you will ever need to know are people sitting around your table, your players. I often find that most of my players fit more than one profile types. People are complex. Maybe we'll prefer fighting more than social encounter, but it doesn't mean that he hates it. 
he may not care much about the underlying political intrigue of the campaign setting, but he loves to interact with Danny DeVito the Bard NPC and busting rhymes together. Furthermore, your players may not even know what type of players they themselves are, so you may not even get an answer if you ask. You might have to run a few games in different ways and observe which part elicit the best reaction from your players. From my own experience, there are two major types of players. I can subdivide it into smaller divisions, but I don't think it's necessary to get my point across. I find that there are those who are interested in the narrative, like the roleplay and the storyline, and then there are those who are mainly interested in combat. We often hear the advice to create parts of the adventure that appeal to each type of players, but that's not enough. If that's all you do, at best, your players are just taking turns to have their fun. At worst, you are creating a gulf between the players by reinforcing their differences. As I mentioned before, two of the 10 expressions of fun is I belong and I am cozy. So to create a sense of camaraderie, I intertwine the two parts of the game together. If they do well following the narrative, they will receive clues that will help them make their combat easier. And if they do well in combat, they can affect the narrative greatly. So it creates a positive feedback loop and thus, they have a stake in helping their party members succeed. So they will feel more like a team and start looking after each other's back. Once you know your player's preferences, that's not really the end of it. Because people change. Preferences can change over time too. I know a player who started playing D&D as a fighter because he just loves combat and he is good at tactical video games. After watching other players play social characters, he created a fast-talking rogue with high charisma. Then he was immediately hooked into the social interaction aspect of the game. Sometimes what prevents your player from really enjoying some activity is them not knowing how to do it well. It is fun to be great at something, and it is even more fun if they know that they are legitimately good at it. So I don't mean just tell them what to do to win. Teach them how to read the clues you have provided them, and how you create your challenge. You may have a different way of running your social encounters, but this is how I usually do them. To succeed at persuading important NPCs, I require my players to know the character's goal, their price, and personality. The more they know, the more I will reduce the difficulty class to persuade that character. Or I will just let them succeed if they know what button to press. Once they have gotten good at certain aspect of the game, like combat or social, don't be too quick to crank up the difficulty. Maybe your best players can keep up with the challenge curve but it may quickly turn into insurmountable challenge for your other players if they are already having difficulty with that aspect of the game. Well, your players do not necessarily have to be good at everything, but make sure that there is some way they can contribute. By the way, don't assume that you don't have to tell veteran players how to succeed. All dungeon masters run their game differently. Veteran players may not be familiar with the way you make your rulings, and the habits they pick up playing with other DMs may not translate into your game. Different DMs are like different game series with their unique system. If I am like CJ Quest, then somebody else is like Matthew Fantasy. That's why I like to play in other people's games even if I have my own style of running them. Hey, while we are on the topic of communication, let me expand a bit on the absolute importance of clear communication. True story. This happened during a game. Once upon a time, when the party of adventurers I was DMing engaged in combat with a group of goblins, a bard player announces that he dropped his pants. So, the goblin shoots him in the soft part. Au contraire, that part was not soft. Then the player continued his protest. That's not how it's supposed to happen, he said. When his character dropped his pants, he expects the goblin to run away. After talking to the player for a bit, I realized that he wanted to scare the goblin away by performing inexplicable acts of perversion. If I had known his intention, I could have asked him to roll for intimidation. But to be honest, it just doesn't suit my logic. Seeing a halfling's cocktail weenie is not going to scare off goblins. That's it. Now this situation is what I call logic misalignment. Your player's sense of cause and effect may be different to yours. This is as much as a real-life problem as it is a gaming problem. People can sometimes be too hung up on the method of doing and forget to communicate their intention. If it is just a bunch of goblins they encounter in the first session, I would just let them try it. But if it is the final boss dragon that had antagonized the players through a two-year campaign, I don't think it's going to make any logical sense or narrative sense that the bard can just roll to seduce the dragon. 
you will need a long and justifiable build-up to allow that, or it will just break the tension and immersion and the emotions your players have invested into your game through the long campaign. So you need to establish the logic of your game. Some DMs would meet their players halfway, but I know other DMs who would not budge at all. I am very firm with my game's internal logic, but I always warn my players when their actions are not going to get their intended result. Here is a very important tip I need to pass on from my previous DM to me and now to you. When your players start doing inexplicable things, ask them what's their intention. It's going to save you from tons of headaches. One last thing before I end the video. Let's talk about character death. Instead of asking, should you kill your player's characters, let's ask the question, why? What is the purpose of killing off characters or threatening them with death? In the context of gameplay, it is a very effective tool to teach your players how to play the game better. Death is a visceral fail condition. We all know that we should avoid it. Play better or die. Simple as that. In the context of narrative, death is a great tool for drama. The eternal regret for failing to achieve one's life goal or that final moment of heroism before impending doom can create the most memorable experience in your campaign. And it is also a quick way out for your players to play a new character. However, gameplay and narrative in D&D often clash. Death becomes a lot less memorable if dead characters can be brought back easily. The fear of death can also cause players to not emotionally invest in their character's development. Sometimes, cowardly players do their best to evade any form of adventure to prevent death. So that's why you shouldn't miss the bigger picture when using death in your game. If the death doesn't serve a purpose, think of other repercussions that will achieve your solution. Instead of getting TPK'd, maybe your player's characters can just wake up to find that they have lost all their possessions. Them trying to pick their stuff back can be a very powerful motivator. Sometimes I grant amnesty to my players for their first few sessions, so that they can get attached to their characters. There is no point in killing characters if your players haven't got a strong enough bond with them yet. <laughs> so as a dungeon master, I usually only kill characters when it serves a purpose, mostly for drama, justified by players playing poorly. I do make exceptions though, for deliberate acts of stupidity. Swim in lava and you are gone forever. All right, that's it for the video. There is just too much to say about all the different ways you can do to challenge your players. I will definitely expand on this topic in the future. I think I have covered everything you need to know as a beginner DM. So if you like this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please do so and join the notification squad. And a warm thank you to my patrons at Patreon for making this series possible. If you'd like to support the channel and series, please visit my Patreon page. CJ, over and out.